This is our last study from the book of Colossians. And uh, next week we start Ezekiel. Now, we started Ezekiel up at Groveland uh, Tuesday night of this week, and we sure had fun with that uh, vision in the first chapter. And uh, why don't you read the first chapter before you come and see if you can figure it out. And I'll give you some, uh, a couple of clues. It'll help you to understand the first chapter of Ezekiel if you'll also read the tenth chapter because a similar vision is... Uh, seen there that will shed some light on it. And also it'll help some if you read the first chapter of Revelation. Uh, so if you read those three chapters before you come next time, it'll help us to uh, get along a little further in the, uh, in the Bible study. We're going to have a good time in Ezekiel, but you're going to have to conduct yourselves a little differently because there's 48 chapters in the book, and obviously we can't do verse by verse like we've been doing in Colossians. And, uh, or else the rapture will be here before we, uh, <laughs> we get halfway through. And, uh, so you'll have to do some of the reading yourselves ahead of time. Now you'll recall that Colossians chapters three and four are the practical outworkings of the doctrinal truths which were taught in chapters one and two. And, and those first two chapters Paul tells us uh, particularly about the personage of the resurrected Christ. That is to say, who he is now, right now, today, and what he's doing today, and his position today. And then he deals with other doctrinal matters. In chapters 3 and 4, he gives you instructions concerning what effect that should have on your own life. Now, we found some general uh, discussion, or that is general instruction, in uh, verses 1 through 17 of chapter 3, and the be then beginning with verse 18, we see instructions to six specific groups of people. In verse 18, wives. In verse 19, husbands. Verse 20, children. Verse 21, fathers. Verse 22, servants. And chapter 4, verse 1, masters. Six different groups of Christians. All, in each case, these instructions are to Christian wives, husbands, children, and so forth. Last week, we dealt with the first three of these individual groups, wives, husband, and children, and we gain considerable insight by comparing the instructions here with uh, the like instructions in the book of Ephesians. Remember, we found the same six groups of people. But we found the instructions expanded considerably, particularly with these first three groups, whereas only one verse of instruction is given for wives in Colossians chapter 3. On the other hand, in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, we find three verses devoted uh, to such instruction, and uh, therefore it could be more expanded, couldn't it? Then. Uh, Whereas we have these two very short lines in Colossians concerning husbands, uh, we find nine verses given in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 uh, to the instruction of husbands. Now, I'm sorry you wives weren't here last week because nine verses of instruction uh, to your husbands uh, uh, might have been uh, something you ought to have heard too, you know. Then... Uh, in uh, chapter 20, we have one verse of instruction to children, whereas the like or parallel scriptures in Ephesians uh, utilize three verses to tell the children what they should do. Now we progress on uh, in verse 21 to the instruction to fathers. And here we have one verse in Colossians and one verse in Ephesians. So we will not get much expansion here. We'll do a little expanding anyway. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, Fathers, provoke, provoke not your children. And we see that to anger is italicized, which means that the translator inserted it uh, because he thought it helped the understanding. When we get over in Ephesians, you can see why he put it there. But if you read it just like it was in the original here, uh, it would be, Fathers, provoke not your children, lest they be discouraged. Uh, for those of you that might 
be looking on some other version. Uh, we're using, of course, the King James with a few of the archaic words changed. This is uh, the new Scofield Reference Bible, and so some of the uh, some of the archaic words may be changed just slightly. So let's look now in, a cha in uh, Ephesians and see uh, what we have here, and we'll find that uh, these instructions will be in uh, chapter 6 of Ephesians. Chapter 6, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke, provoke not your children to wrath, See, here we have to wrath and the to anger in the Colossian, the Colossian letter is italicized. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So in Colossians, you have a, a good reason why, uh, fathers, a good reason why. Uh, you should be careful not to provoke your children or children, or that is, deal with them in such a way uh, that they'll be discouraged. It says, see, Pro provoke not your children, lest they be discouraged. Whereas in uh, Ephesians, it's bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, nurture uh, simply has to do with that which uh, upon which the children feed. It means to feed them properly. And of course, uh, here the instruction concerning spiritual food, concerns itself with spiritual food. This word admonition has as its primary meaning instruction. So the Bible says, fathers, you're charged with the responsibility of bringing your children up in instruction from the Lord. The, the phrase here in the original would uh, carry that type of weight. God is instructing children. But children don't know it, fathers. Children, children don't know, just offhand, that God has some instruction for them. And so it's your responsibility to see that your children receive instruction from God. Now, most of us who consider ourselves fundamental, church-attending, Bible-believing Christians seem to gather the idea that if we send our child to Sunday school for 30 minutes of instruction there, and if we take them occasionally to church, or maybe even one or two times a week to church, that our children will thereby be nurtured spiritually and instructed by the Lord. Well, this is a far cry from, from what God says. For instance, let's uh, keep your place in Colossians, if you will, and go back to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and this is just one, one place where we find uh, this uh, nature of, of instructions. Deuteronomy 6, 6, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between their eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Now, what do you suppose he means? He means everywhere your children go, However they occupy themselves from the moment they arise in the morning until they go to bed at night, they're to understand what God says about every situation. You can't send kids to the custody of the church, even if it's a good church, from one to four hours a week, and send, then send them for the rest of the week into the world's system of accumulating knowledge, and then call those children nurtured and admonished by the Lord. It just doesn't fit. We hear the church, school, and home. Well, of these three groups, who has the children for more hours a week? 
while their ears are open. Are children listening for more hours of the week? Are they listening to instruction in the church? Are they listening most to instruction in the church or in the home or in the school? Well, uh, I don't know how it is in New Zealand, but in this country, uh, uh, while they're home, uh, most of the instruction they get is in front of the tube. Uh, in, uh, in school, uh, certainly if we measure it in terms of hours, they get a lot more. Well, now our schools, our tax-supported schools, are teaching children, teaching our children, that there is no God that it's very foolish to believe in God, and God, there's no God that has spoken to people. You say, well, I never heard of my children being told that. Well, to omit direct pointed instruction that there is a God to regard is the most insidious method of telling a young mind that there is no God to regard. You see, if there's... If there's a God, the most important question for any human being, if there is a God, now, the word God implies omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. If, if one is not that, he's a false God. Those are necessary requirements to be a God. A God must be everywhere at the same time, he must know everything, and he must be all-powerful, or he is not God. Now, if there's a God, then the most important question on the mind of man must necessarily be, has God spoken to man? This is, this is the most important question for consideration to a creature, if there is a creator. Has God spoken? In, in our regular uh, school structure, the answer is very loud and very clearly, no, he has not. Then uh, the next question is, if God has spoken, then the only real important question to any human being is, what does God say? What does God say? Well, we educate our children in the atmosphere. God hadn't said anything. I didn't say anything. He hadn't. Ain't no word. But God has said something. And one of the things he says is that all, A-L-L, -L, all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ Jesus. Now, that's what God says. All of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ Jesus. It's a fearsome thing, fathers, to bring human life into this world. Why do you think God had Abraham circumcised? What do you think that means anyhow? By submitting his body to circumcision, Abraham said this, I agree. I uh, take my part of my covenant of God that I will not be responsible for bringing human life into this world unless I also agree to instruct that human creature in the knowledge and admonition of the Lord. That's what he was saying. And when his little boy, baby, uh, baby boy, was eight days old, he had that little uh, baby circumcised. And when he did that, he was saying that I hereby pledge to God that this little uh, flesh belongs to God and he will be instructed and he will be instructed to instruct. that he will not be responsible for bringing humanity in this world without seeing that they are <coughs> brought up in the admonition of the Lord. Now, isn't it rather strange that the instructions that we received here for wives and husbands and children, 
Well, it's somewhat expanded if you take both books together. But for fathers, it's very short and to the point. You know, uh, in my uh, business operation, uh, they have uh, courses in uh, communication. They say, well, most of the problems of the world is that the communications break down. So uh, they have these uh, seminars and things and how to communicate. And one of the cardinal rules is this. The more instruction you put in any uh, communication, the less emphasis will be dealt in each area of instruction. And if you really want something to be important, and you really uh, uh, want people to believe it, just give one instruction in one communication. Because when you put two, you weaken each of them some. You're, you're just getting, getting across some information. And if you put too many, just forget it. Because uh, the uh, just the mental reaction will be, well, if it had been important, he wouldn't have uh, clouded it up with all this other stuff. Well, God says for fathers, there's one thing that's important. Bring your children up in the admonition, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And don't you dare call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. And don't you dare stand before your God one day and say, yes, I brought children into the world. And I took them to Sunday school. And once in a while, I, I stayed myself. Uh, no, that's not what he has in mind at all. One day years ago, I found out that... Uh, there's a little group of Christians in this town that had organized a, a Christian day school. And uh, somebody asked me about it one time. So I said, well, I went by and looked at it and was in an old house in a rundown section of town. And, uh, oh my, it's sort of crummy. And uh, so I didn't think that was for me. So I was just challenged. When I said that that didn't look too uh, good a place to send a Kelso, uh, said, "All right, just do one thing. Number one, just ask God: Is this of Him or is it not? Is this establishment something He raised up or isn't it? Now, it, it, God will God will let you know if you want to know." And if he lets you know that it isn't, forget about it. If he lets you know that it is, then you ask him if he had your children in mind when he raised this up. And uh, so I took that advice and I got a, an affirmative answer both times. Yes, God raised that up. And yes, he had my children in mind. And I'll tell you what. When God got that cross to me, I'd have been scared to death to send my kids anywhere else. And uh, some of my well-meaning Christian friends, as my kids got a little older, said, well, now that school's not accredited, you know, Don, and your children are likely to be disadvantaged when they want to progress on up into uh, something a little further along. The world system, the world educational system, you see, has a system of accreditation. They say if you measure up in areas where we say you should measure up, then uh, uh, your product will be acceptable in the next echelon. You know what I found out? <coughs> I found out that the world educational system doesn't trust its own system of accreditation. As a matter of fact, uh, the world educational system, and when I say that, I mean in any particular country, the recognized uh, educational authorities. That's what I'm talking about. I find out this, that they've set the standards, but they sure don't trust them. The fact is, they pay very, very little attention to it. Um, and the business world almost tends to discredit it. 
they're afraid that uh, that the employee will uh, will bank on that some. Now I happen to be in the hiring end of the business world and have been for some twenty years. For those of you that might not might know, I uh, I'm my job is recruiting and training people uh, in in uh, organizing their own insurance businesses. And I've been doing this for, as I say, 20-some years, and I've been involved with 40 to 50 people. And obviously, uh, however poorly I might perform, my company thinks it's been sufficient in order to uh, keep me on the payroll uh, year, year by year. That's as much as I'll say along those lines. I might get into trouble. But anyway... I, I will speak for the men I work with. When I go to a conference, I go to a conference with uh, between 25 and 30 men uh, who hold the same position I do in the state of Florida. And we talk about things and we get instructions and so forth. And you know, our rules say that you shouldn't ever appoint uh, a man in the agency unless he is a, a graduate of a good accredited university. That's one of our principles, one of our guidelines we go by. And uh, the rules further say that in order to get from that uh, position to the next higher position, we simply will not, under any circumstances, even consider a candidate who's not been uh, graduated from a, a good accredited university. Now, we put those in the rules. And then we completely ignore them. You say, well, that's not very, uh, very wise, is it? Well, we just learned from experience that there's ways to select. <laughs> I, uh, I was told by my next superior. Uh, he said, now, Don says, uh, in such and such a town, this is the the type of man we want to get because we want you to get someone that would be. Uh, a good candidate to go on up in the in the company, and he needs to have this qualification and that qualification and that qualification. And one of these qualifications was uh, that he be uh, uh, have a four-year degree and preferably in in a state university. And I asked him. I happen to know that he has been responsible for elevating three young men into that position where you just cannot possibly put a man unless he has his background. I says, well, now, let's see. We appointed Barry Rush. Uh, what is Barry Rush, uh, Barry Rush's uh, educational background? Well, you know, Barry has made such an outstanding record as an agent. We decided to forego uh, this requirement. He actually has only had one year of college. And, uh, but uh, uh, he is a dynamic young man, and, and we think that it, this was a good time for an exception. And I says, well, I'm glad to know that. I says, well, three months ago, uh, we brought Don Bennett into the situation. What uh, college did he graduate from? And he says, well, Don, uh, he, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, actually, Don didn't really go to college, but he, he's, uh, he's taken some night courses, and he's done well on them, and he plans to go on and get his college education through studying at night, and he's just got a lot on the ball. And so uh, uh, we thought he'd... Well, let's see. Six months ago, we put on Jim Smith. Uh, I remember. Now, that's the last three we put on. Uh, where, where, did, where did Jim graduate from? Well, Jim had to drop out of college in his third year because his father died and so forth and so on. But I'll tell you what about Jim. Uh, he's made an outstanding record, and he's a a good family man, and uh, he's a good businessman, and uh, uh, we just felt like we couldn't pass him up. Now, three out of three, and it, you just can't do it, see. I remember when my oldest son picked a, a Christian college to go to that wasn't accredited by anybody. I don't know what it is now or not. This, he entered in 64, and, uh, and they have some sort of accreditation now. Then people would ask me, where's Don going to school? And so far, well, that school's not accredited, is it? I said, well, 
I don't know. He feels like that's where the Lord wants him to go, and I understand it's a fine Christian school. And, uh, well, uh, Don had no problem. He was a school teacher and a coach for two years, and now he's in the business world. And uh, uh, well, he, uh, they weren't interested in that. They were interested in what he could do. They were really, you know, what they were more interested in. What did he do during his college years uh, in the way of uh, uh, of working and so forth? And when they found out that uh, he worked uh, in the produce department of a, of a grocery store for two years to earn his money, and then. Uh, 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 another year that he he had a milk route and uh, uh, they wanted him to come with the company full time and, and he had some letters of recommendation for people. They were ten times more interested in that than who accredited the college. And he asked the question. When my uh, oldest daughter uh, finished uh, school over here at Lakeman Christian Day School in the ninth grade, they only went to the ninth grade then, uh, we thought we'd like to send her to a Christian high school, so we found one not too far away. And uh, some of our friends, but I've, I've heard about that school. I understand that it's a good school, but uh, we inquired, and it's not accredited. And she's going to have a hard time getting into a good college. Well, you know, in the junior year, they take these tests and things. And uh, uh, so uh, she took the tests. And uh, she didn't know just where she wanted to go to college, so she applied for and they all accepted her. And that school, I know, is still not accredited. And, by the way, when she got her degree from college, it was not in education, it was in social work, and uh, she decided the Lord wanted her to be a, a school teacher. So, and she didn't have enough uh, of the that type of credit, you know, to be a school teacher. So, uh, uh, some school up where her husband was finishing up uh, suggested she teach. They knew she was a college graduate. She says, well, I'm not qualified. And, and they uh, interviewed her. And I said, well, we think we want you anyway. I'll tell you what. If you'll come and teach in our school, we'll pay for the courses in the nearby college for you to take at night so that uh, we can tell everybody that our teachers have all had the proper number of hours of, of uh, education courses. So she got it free. They paid for it. You see... If you will do what the Lord says to do, and he says to bring your children up instructed by God, he'll take care of the rest of them. I've had that question asked me so t many times, but it isn't accredited. My younger son now attends Clearwater Christian College, or he did for two and a half years, and he's taking a recess to go down to South America. And, uh, of course, you're not supposed to do that either, interrupt your college education to uh, go off and work at some Christian camp in South America for a while. Uh, but anyhow, uh, where does David go to school? Oh, he goes over to Clearwater Christian College. Well, we were, we were inquiring about, but Don, that's not accredited. I want to tell you something. This accreditation business is I'll just put it real nice. It's utterly distrusted by its own system. And I don't, I don't have any fear of being contradicted because I know from experience. And I've talked enough about my own kids. But I have plenty more stories I could tell you, you know, along those lines. And uh, so, I'll tell you what you do. If you're raising kids in this world, you make sure of one thing, that you're doing what God says to do. And he says, fathers, it's your responsibility. He doesn't give this responsibility to mothers now. Now, last time mom will give you some trouble, Papa. Because, uh, but it's not her responsibility. According to God, you brought that child into the world. That that child is the seed of your body, men. And God will hold you responsible for doing concerning that offspring of yours, what he says to do. He will now. And the only instruction he gives right here is, you bring that child up in the admonition 
and in the nurture of the Lord. And I believe he means it. I really believe he means it. I don't believe he was kidding. And to the best of my ability, I'm going to do that first, and all the rest of it can come along if it happens uh, to come along. But that's not going to concern me very much. Because as best I know, God didn't tell me that he would consider my kids uneducated and unequipped for what he wants them to do in this world based on whether or not some human agency put its proper stamp of approval on some phase of their instruction. As best I know, he didn't speak concerning that. But he did speak concerning this other. And he got my ear. And uh, I want to tell you that he doesn't tell you to do anything unless he faithfully supplies the financial needs and whatever. Whatever. He just opens the way. When you want to set your mind... I'm going to find out if God is speaking concerning this matter. And if he is, I'm going to walk that way. If he's speaking, then you see, uh, he'll take care of the rest of it. And I, I can testify to that. You see, I get a little more dogmatic along these lines as I go along because I can look back. Uh, there was a time, you know, when you launch out on faith and, and the listener could say, well, well, let's wait and see. Yeah. Wait and see. But pretty soon, uh, uh, you walk so far along the road and uh, some of the evidence becomes undeniable. Now, I don't know what you might have gathered. You might have thought I'm overly critical of some sort of institution that we pay for with our taxes or something like that. <laughs> And uh, uh, I confess I might have been, I apologize, but my main point is I want to impress upon fathers the fact that God says they have something to do here. And I want to impress upon wives and mothers-to-be that God is telling your husband and the father of your children something, and don't you interfere with it. And don't you pick you out a husband that doesn't believe God means it when he speaks. Because unfortunately, most uh, of the men in the Christian world that would essay to be fathers just don't get this kind of instruction. They just don't get the point. But they better if they want to be claimed to do what God says to do. Now that's a whole two-thirds of a Bible study on one verse, and that's not the... Uh, and most of you here aren't even fathers. Uh, but uh, let's go on. Verse 22. Now we have four verses for servants. And uh, four for servants in Ephesians. And this word servants here is the word slave at the time this letter was written to the Colossians as I understand it as the information comes down to me approximately one half of the population of the civilized world were had to call some other man master that is to say about half the population were slaves or were bonded to another person that was the social situation in those days and uh, I'll tell you this. Now, God has some thoughts on this subject, and I'll assure you they're very unpopular, even among Christians. So I'm not going to comment too much. I'm going to let God comment, and uh, I might say a few things. But I'll assure you that this type of uh, instruction just doesn't uh, fit our concept. <laughs> Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. That means your human masters. 
not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatever you do, do it heartily as under the Lord, or just as though the Lord were telling you, just as, just as though the Lord was your master instead of this human being, and not unto men, knowing that, the Lord, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of person. Now, the general gist of this is this. You worry, you worry about doing a good job of what you're expected to do, and you keep in mind all the time that God has all of eternity to balance the books in case you're not getting everything you think you ought to. Now, that's the general gist of it. You trust God, in other words, and keep your eye on the long-range situation. Now, there's quite a lot of instruction along these lines, and let's go back to uh, this uh, Ephesians uh, scripture, Ephesians chapter 6. It'll say largely the same thing with slightly less, with, uh, with a slight different inflection probably. Ephesians Chapter 6, verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. In other words, uh, perform just as though Christ was your master instead of this human being, not with eye services, men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, they're talking about slaves and free men. Bond means uh, you're bonded to an individual human being. Now, uh, the next uh, passage we want to look at on this same subject is in 1 Timothy. You can see, it's Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and then 1 Timothy. Chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke. Now, here again, under the yoke is a term which means you're a slave. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, this is talking to Christian servants, Christian slaves. And they that have, uh, that they that have believing masters, in other words, if your master is a Christian also, let them, that is the servant or the slave, not despise the master, because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. In other words, if your master is a Christian, well, then uh, you uh, uh, serve him even better uh, so that he'll be able uh, to utilize whatever good there is in the Lord's work. Now, look what it says about this in verse 3. If any man teach otherwise than what he's just taught and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, not knowing nothing, and doting about questions and so forth. He, he has some pretty rough things to say about somebody that doesn't go along with this line of teaching. Now look at uh, uh, the next scripture along these lines will be two more books over the book of Titus, Titus 2.9. Paul says to Titus, he says, in Titus 2.9, exhort servants or slaves to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. That is, don't talk back. And not purloining. That means don't steal anything from him. But showing all good fidelity, faithfulness, that is, that they may adorn the doctrine of God or Savior in all things, for the grace of God hath bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Now, another uh, scripture, 1 Peter 2.18. It's not just Paul talking this way. 1 Peter 2.18. Now, here's the rough one. Servants or slaves, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also uh, to the froward. That means perverse or contrary. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards a God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it when ye are buffeted or pummeled for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile 
find, found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he uh, suffered, he, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Now let me have a few words to say about this. There's one other scripture that you might want to look up, and it's in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. The gist of it is this, that if you're, when you get saved, if you happen to be a slave, don't worry about it if you're a slave. If, you can, if your master will free you, fine. Take your freedom. But uh, don't let it bother you. And it says this, because in this world, if you're a slave, you're still Christ's free man. Because uh, if, when the Son shall set you free, you shall be really free. And he says, and if you happen to be a free man, you're really a slave of Jesus Christ. So everybody, whether you're free or slave, you're, everybody's free and everybody's a slave. Now, that's the reason. I guess we shouldn't omit that. We better look back there and see that because uh, we, we want to be sure that God says it and not just Kelso. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Sometimes I try to hurry along a little bit because I see I'm not going to get all my subject matter across. And uh, then the Lord says, no, you show them what I say about that. Now, don't uh, worry about the time. Uh, verse 20 of uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Let every man abide in the same calling in which he was called. Art thou called being a servant? I mean, when you got saved, were you a servant or a slave? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant, for ye are bought with a price. Be ye not servants of men. That is to say, don't consider yourself uh, in, rela in your relationship to men. He says, here's two Christians. One of them's a slave and one of them's a master. If the master is a real Christian, he's a slave too. He's a slave of Jesus Christ. If the uh, slave is a real Christian, he's free in Christ. And he shouldn't worry about it. Whatever happens to you in this life is just for such a short time. And God will use it. Now, if you read carefully the scriptures on this subject matter, you find out this, that in God's eternal economy, usually it's better to be the subjected in this life, the subjugated, rather than the free. It gives you more opportunity to yield and learn and understand that we have a master. And um, he's going to get into this when he, when he speaks of the instruction to the master. And it's a, a chance for you to operate your faith like no other chance. If you can say, look, I've got it rotten in this world. But why should that make any difference to me? It's just that any beady, eaty much of time when all of eternity God is going to show his glories and grace to me that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding greatness of his mercies towards me in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. And in another place, uh, our light affliction here is but for a moment. And it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Some of the people that we pitied most in this life you know, like blind people, isn't that horrible? They had to be blind all his life. Or people that are handicapped in, in many ways. We're going to find out that they'll be more blessed in eternity. The, uh, the comparison that you see will be greater. And those who we pity, you see, this is why the world understands. You say, why would God let that happen to them? Well, God knows what he's doing. It gives a chance to exercise our faith, to say, God is too wise to make any mistakes. And God loves me too much to hurt me. So bring it on, whatever it is. See, that's faith. God's too wise to make any mistakes of any kind. And God loves me too much to do something to my disadvantage. So what difference does it make? Did you ever know this? Christ and Paul preaching every day 
in a society where half the people were slaves and they never encouraged a single slave to run away and never told a single master to free a slave. Now, we just don't think like that, do we? But you find it in this Bible. You find anywhere in this Bible that God instructed a master to free his slave. As a matter of fact, when Paul found Onesimus, who was a slave, and he'd run away from his master, you know what he did? Sent him back to his master and said, be a good slave. We don't think like that, see. Because our whole psychology of thought has been directed in another direction. So don't be too hard on yourself if you can't quite assimilate that into your uh, thought process. But I just have to tell you, that's how God thinks. And that's the reason we should read the Bible, so we should know more about how God thinks. And regardless of how it looks, God thinks right. Yeah, <laughs> he does. He thinks right. Why, most of the do-good campaigns you have going on in this world under the name of God and his program, God wouldn't touch with a ten-foot pole. Then what is God's thoughts about those type things? Listen, God wants to prove that the Christian life can be lived in whatever circumstances one finds himself. So he wants all different type of circumstances. So that can be shown forth to the glory of God. He wants communist governments. Now, if you tell that, if, if, if you dare tell Billy James Hargis or Carl McIntyre, some of those guys I said that, I'll have to run for my life or something. But I want to tell you this. It's God's will that there be communist countries in this world. I'm glad I'm not in one of them. And I'm glad it wasn't God's will to put me there. And, uh, uh, and I say they're satanic. But if God said they couldn't be here, they wouldn't be here. And I'll guarantee you that. If he didn't permit them. Now, you read Daniel, especially chapter 4, and he'll tell you that in no uncertain terms. Why would God permit a communist nation like Russia? Because... For his eternal purposes, he wants to show something. And what you're going to find out when you get to glory, if you make it, that uh, there will be a lot of Russians there. Yes, sir. He's got them by the thousands. Old Elijah says, I'm the only one left, Lord. God says, I got 7,000 priests. I've got 7,000 spokesmen that have never bowed their knee to an idol. Because you're just looking at it from your viewpoint, Elijah. If you could see it from my viewpoint, you wouldn't get all shook up like that. Elijah says, God says, that old mean queen is after me and I'm the only one left. Just let me die. He saw everything from his perspective. See, that's what we do. We see it all from our perspective. <coughs> well... I'm sure I could get into some trouble if I don't progress on here. Uh, but I would say, if you want to wonder about this matter, just look back up in verse 24 of chapter 3, knowing that, the Lord, that of the Lord ye shall receive reward. And that's the whole answer. That's <coughs> Colossians 3, 24. Now, we got one verse to masters. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye have... Uh, ye also have a master in heaven. Now, that's about the, the gist of the instructions to masters. He didn't say, masters, turn ye loose your slaves. He didn't tell them that. Why didn't he tell them that? Because it's God's purpose to show forth that a man can be a free man, though he's a captive. Yeah, that's why. Why do you think he put Paul in jail? Because Caesar was so strong that God couldn't help himself. And poor old Paul had a God that was so weak that Caesar was greater. Is that why Paul was in jail? God wanted to show something. That's why Paul could say, in whatever state I am, I'm content.
Chapter 4, verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Verse 3, praying for us. I counted five times where Paul said in his letter, he says, I wish y'all would do something for me. How about praying for me? Now, Paul had physical infirmities. And uh, most of the times when he asked for prayer, as is the case here, he was in jail. He didn't say, y'all, please pray somebody to go my bail. Get me out of this dirty old jail. No, he didn't pray that. No, he just prayed. Look what he prayed, verse 3. Praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in bonds. <clears throat> Read the last chapter in the book of Acts, and you'll find out the answer to this. He led almost all those people that guarded him to Christ. And then they went back into Caesar's household and began leading all the wheels to Christ. That's why he prayed what happened. And these people evidently prayed because that's what happened. He said, pray for us. I've said this before when, when we were, had our first lesson or two in Colossians, that Bible prayers are so different from ours, and mainly because the main thrust of Bible praying is to center in on those who are doing God's work, those who are in the forefront of the battle. Now, we pray mostly for the stragglers, those that are dragging their foot physically or those that are falling by the wayside spiritually and all such as that. And the Bible doesn't say not to pray for them, but the main thrust of your prayer effort is supposed to be for those out in the front of the fight. Those, and, that, and when Paul said, look, he didn't say, look, I, I want you to do something. So-and-so sick, would you please pray for him? And so-and-so is this way. Would you No. Every time he said pray, it was something to do with our work might be more effective. That's what he asked for prayer about. Now, that's not, that, that's not the way we do it, is it? No. Poor old Aunt Martha's arthritis gets mentioned so often and uh, that type of thing, you know. Uh, very little praying about the the spiritual warfare that's going on. Let's go on. Verse 4. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. He says, that's what I want prayers for. Boy, I want to make my message clear. You pray that what I say will be effective. And listen to. As I said, I read these same uh, requests five times in these epistles. He didn't just tell these Colossians to pray for him. He had all the Christians all over praying. That's one of the main reasons he wrote them a letter. He wanted them to pray for him. We don't understand prayer that way, do we? Verse 5, walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. W those without means people that aren't saved, people that haven't come to Christ. It says, always have an uppermost in your mind that your walk, your progress in this world will be such that you'll be without reproach. People won't, can't point a finger and say, yeah, he calls himself a Christian, huh? Uh, then this verse 6 is, is, is a very, very uh, interesting verse. Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. <laughs> what do you reckon he means? Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Remember, Jesus says, ye are the salt of the world. You know, there's a, there's a very interesting verse in the book of Mark. It says, let every sacrifice be seasoned with salt. What do you suppose that means? Um, I don't know if I can find it um, right offhand, but um, that's what it says. Yeah. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt had lost its saltness, with what shall you season it? Have salt in yourselves. Literal salt? No, salt is a figurative word in the Bible. And the key to it is back in the Old Testament, that story about Elisha, you know, when he put some salt in the water and turned it from bitter water into sweet water. 
Salt in the Bible stands for the preserving power of Christ and his gospel. There's a sense in which when, when uh, Christians talk like they ought to talk, that it uh, withholds the putrefaction of society. Uh, when the Christian church is taken out of society at the rapture of the church, the whole world system will putrefy in seven years because there won't be any salt to keep the advance of the putrefaction down. There was a little double effect there, wasn't it? <laughs> so that's what salt is. Let your conversation be so such that it tends to withstay the putrefying effect of what usually comes out of the mouth of man. Now, those of you who were here for our first Bible lesson will remember that we, uh, we did verses 7 through 18. This is the conclusion, of the summing up, verses 7 through 18. In our first Bible study, we did that along with the introduction. So we don't have to do that now, and I'm sorry if you weren't here. But in our first Bible study, we did the introduction, which is the first few verses in the first chapter, and we did the conclusion, because they, the two go together. For instance, this fellow, Epiphus, in verse 12, he's in both of those sections. And we talked about him. He, now, he was a real prayer warrior. Notice verse 12, chapter 4, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. What did he pray for? Did he pray that um, God would kind of help your indigestion? No. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. wonder what's the difference between praying fervently like old Epaphras and what we do when we pray. Then one other little attention I want to call to you. Look at verse 18. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. See, Paul had an ailment, and as best we know, he was just about blind. And uh, he couldn't hardly write. He couldn't see to write himself. And he uh, always dictated his letters to somebody else, and they wrote them. And then at the end of the letter, he would always put some little salutation remark so they could know that the letter was from him. And you see this mentioned uh, quite frequently, except he didn't do that in two of his letters. He didn't do it in Galatians. And he makes the comment, you'll find this in Galatians 6.11. He says, see what a long letter I've written with my own hand? He makes a, a really a comment out of the fact that uh, some people say that that means, see what le large letters I've written. But he... he I think he means, see how much I've written all by myself, because he usually didn't do that. And then the little short letter to Philemon, he, he wanted to make it very, very personal. And he told, he made a point of telling Philemon, I'm writing this with my own hand. But otherwise, uh, he dictated the letter to someone else and then put his little salutation on it in each case. See uh, 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians. Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. The next, the last verse there, 2 Thessalonians 3.17, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token of every epistle, so I write. He says, so you can know it's from me. Now, he particularly did this in 2 Thessalonians because somebody had written a letter to the Thessalonians saying, I'm Paul and I'm telling you to do so forth. And the whole reason or the big reason Paul wrote this was to say, I didn't write that letter they said I wrote. It didn't have my signature on it, did it? It didn't have my salutation. Well, I didn't write it. What they said was a bunch of bunk, and don't you listen to it. Now, that's the gist of 2 Thessalonians. You'll find it if you read it through. But... And this was the end of this tape.